It's The Real News. I'm Aaron Maté. A second German soldier has been arrested in the investigation into an alleged false flag terror attack. The suspects are accused of plotting to shoot left-wing politicians and then pin the blame on Syrian refugees in Germany. The first soldier in the plot was found to be posing as a Syrian. The case has fueled concern over a larger neo-Nazi network within the German army. Liz Fakiti is director of the Institute of Race Relations in London. Liz, welcome. Uh, hi, hi. Hi. So this is an unusual case. Can you tell us what we know about it so far as details slowly come out? Well, it all sort of started um, about a week ago when the evidence emerged that this lieutenant in the German army, a young soldier, had been arrested. Um, it all happened after a tip-off because he'd left a sort of gun in a toilet in, uh, in an airport uh, in Vienna. And he was arrested and sort of uh, investigation rumbled on and a death list was found of some of the politicians that you mentioned. should also say that um, there was a plan also to attack refugee centres. It's quite extraordinary because he had uh, taken over the fake identity of a Syrian refugee. How that happened is a long story. Uh, he was arrested shortly afterwards, a student accomplice was arrested. Uh, live ammunition was found in one of their um, one of the places where they were living, had been stolen from the military. And only a few days ago, it was announced that a second soldier had been arrested. Uh, it's believed that they were part of a cell of probably five people. And the case rumbles on because for a number of years now, there has been concerns that the German military haven't been doing enough to investigate uh, and to get rid of soldiers with neo-Nazi affiliations. So it's part of a bigger scandal, I'm afraid. So let's get into those larger issues. Um, people around the world have been looking to Europe with a lot of concern, tracking the rise of the far right over uh, these recent years. Uh, can you place uh, this German case in the wider context of anti-immigrant sentiment in Europe that you've been studying so extensively? There is the, the issue of the huge increase in racial violence around Europe. So in this case, as I mentioned, the uh, neo-Nazis within the army were planning to attack uh, left-wing social democrat politicians, but they were also targeting asylum seekers in their refugee hostels. And there's been a massive increase in racial violence on refugee hostels all around Germany, indeed in Sweden, Netherlands and other places. In the UK, particularly after the decision to leave the European Union, you might have heard of Brexit there in America. Um, there, I mean, in the immediate aftermath of that, there was what people have described as a kind of celebratory racism, people going out on the streets uh, and, and, and feeling really liberated and that they could make really disgusting racist comments, pull off the hijabs um, of, of Muslim women, etc. And of course, we had uh, the murder by a far-right sympathiser of the Labour MP, Joanna Cox, in this country. And um, throughout Europe, actually, there have been numerous attacks on refugees, immigrants, but also left-wing politicians. And one thing that I like to remind people about is that the Oslo ma massacre by Anders Breivik was also of a sign of political violence against the left, because those 50-odd uh, youngsters murdered so callously and horribly by Breivik were attending a Labour Party youth camp in an island on uh, Utøya Island. So yeah, this is the problem that we face in terms of the rise of racism and racial violence. However, not all of this violence is carried out by far right and white supremacists. Some of it is carried out by, say, villagers in a small town in Germany who do not want a refugee hostel there. And uh, so, so that's one issue. But there is another issue of the far right that I feel is not sufficiently understood and is the greatest issue that we face because you and the US, I'm sure you would have been following the election in France and the larger score for a 
far, far right candidate since the Second World War in the second round for Marilene Le Pen. But the focus when it's just on what happens on in elections, whether it's national, local, regional, can actually obscure a bigger problem in society, which is the problem of collusion between far right and extreme right parties and the police and the military and the security services. So you actually have a situation in Greece with Golden Dawn, which is a horrible far right party, whose um, 18 of its parliamentarians are actually facing a, a criminal, um, a, a large scale criminal investigation are on trial for um, the murder of, um, linked to the murder of an anti-fascist Pablo Fisas, but, you know, basically a criminal conspiracy involved not just in, in attacks on, on, on immigrants, on Muslims, but actually, you know, operating like the mafia. So you have a problem that groups like Golden Dawn, Front National, have high levels of support in the police and the military. So the problem is that if they achieve power, you know, if they achieve power, if they have access to the leverage within the state law enforcement institutions, you're really in a different ball game altogether. Uh, I think you understand that in the US now. So let me ask you uh, about the problems, not just on the far right, but also in those considered in the center. Um, you mentioned France. When Le Pen lost, there was obviously a huge sigh of relief from anybody who opposes racism. But I think that what the uh, uh, reaction to the France election overlooked is that, especially in a case like France, racism against Muslims has meanwhile been mainstreamed. So it's not just a problem of the far right in defeating someone like Marie Le Pen. Absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. It's, it's a really difficult situation to, to, to be in. Um, I mean, we work very closely with the Collective Against Islamophobia in France. Um, this problem of Islamophobia is a form of racism which actually cuts across left and right. So you have a sense from the, the, the Socialist Party in France, for instance, were quite happy to support and even extend bans on the hijab, uh, obviously full face veil coverings, etc. Um, because in France there is a concept of secularism which actually goes beyond any concept of secularism in the Anglo-Saxon world, for instance, where secularism means that the state doesn't identify itself with, with any religion, but upholds the rights of all people of all faiths to, uh, to practice their religion. Whereas in, in France, the concept of laissez-faire or secularism is no visible expression of religion in the public space. So it's been, Islamophobia has been a problem as much in the Socialist Party as it has been in uh, the Republicans, in the right parties, and in the F F FN. You know, having said that, I think the general feeling was, and I think I certainly shared this feeling, is that although people might say that, you know, everything will carry on as normal, now Macron is in power, nothing will change in terms of the racism that various communities face, there is a sense that, you know, going back to the points that I was making before, that if Le Pen had achieved the presidency, how it would have emboldened her supporters, emboldened white supremacists, white nationalist movements, would have emboldened counter-jihadi and Islamic movements to feel that now that there was no longer the rule of law in terms of minorities and that this celebratory racism that we saw after Brexit was legitimate now because their person was in power. So it's not an easy situation. Um, certainly in France, people do not feel that there has been any step forward in terms of Islamophobia with the election of Macron. Okay, so let's contrast that with another country that you mentioned earlier, Greece. I think one policy of the uh, Syriza government in Greece that's been overlooked, but I think it provides a really striking contrast to what we're seeing in Europe is how Syriza granted citizenship to tens of thousands of children uh, of immigrants. Um, a real departure from what we're seeing elsewhere. I'm wondering if you can talk about that and whether that provides a model for what could be followed in Europe to address the issues that we're facing today. Yeah, certainly when Syriza came into power, they came into power with a, a lot of vision and a, a lot of hope for what they could do in terms of rectifying injustices, long-term injustice, in terms of 
precarious citizens, young people. And yes, they did that on coming to power. Unfortunately, the situation with austerity and the, um, you know, the, the conditionalities imposed on Greece uh, has made things incredibly difficult in terms of achieving justice for recent migrants and refugees. And now we have imposed on Greece, of course, is the EU-Turkey deal, um, which means that um, uh, that Greece is basically being used as a buffer state to stop the forward movement of refugees who are landing in Greece um, after taking perilous sea journeys um, uh, to the rest of Europe. And, and Europe has renegged. It's really terrible what's happening. The EU countries, there's no solidarity between EU countries in terms of meeting their obligations to take their quota of refugees after you know the mo extraordinary movement of people since summer 2015. So. You know, Greece and Syriza are in the position where they are actually having to do the dirty work of the EU. It means that every refugee who uh, arrives um, in Europe, unless um, in Greece, unless you're from, from Syria, you will be returned to Turkey. And under this one in, one out agreement, uh, the, a Syrian refugee to return to Turkey will be replaced by a Syrian who comes through a, an organised, so-called organised passage. So basically, I'm afraid it means that in Greece, at the moment, the detention centres are places of huge misery, uh, squalor. Um, you know, there's been 13 refugee and migrant deaths in Greece over, I think, about the last, uh, you know, the last 12 months. Um, and six of these have taken place in the so-called hotspots. And I'm afraid the management of these places is pretty diabolical. And although the overall situation is not of Syria's Syria's making, um, you know, everybody is just blaming blaming each other. And that's not a good situation for anyone. So finally, Liz, um, connecting these issues, can the uh, surge in, in far-right um, politics in Europe, can it be slowed without also stopping uh, the uh, wave of uh, neoliberal austerity policies that you mentioned? Mm. This is, you know, you've hit on the fundamental contradiction. Um, you know, Chomsky, I was in London recently and I saw that he was giving a lecture and he said something that I think was very, very pertinent that it's actually the neoliberal policies that have hollowed out democracy and have created the conditions for, for fascism. Uh, for me, uh, looking at this issue in the round, there are a lot of similarities between the way neoliberal policies um, crush people. You know, they're crushing ordinary people. Uh, whether it's black people, migrants, refugees, or, or even white workers are being crushed. And it's very similar to the fascist approach to human dignity, which is pretty crushing as well. What I see happening actually at the moment, looking at the larger picture, is that actually um, I think that states are very canny and I think that neoliberalism will try to rejuvenate itself through embracing aspects of nationalism in sense of embracing the idea of a stronger state. So the idea of the sort of state floating free and leaving everything to the market, I think we will see changes in that. In terms of patterns recently, in terms of far right um, support for far right parties, Alternative for Germany is do, still doing well, still getting into regional parliaments, but it's not making the breakthrough that people are predicting. Le Pen hasn't made the breakthrough. In Austria, the Freedom Party haven't made the breakthrough. So it's um, it's looking to see how these things balance, balance themselves out and whether neoliberalism is going to embrace aspects of nationalism. Certainly that's what we've seen in the UK with um, after Brexit, the Conservative Party basically taking on the policies of UKIP. So we talk about the UKIPization of the Conservative Party. Um, but it's not all bleak. Um, it's very turbulent times and things are changing very rapidly. But I see uh, social movements growing. I see care and solidarity growing. We talked about the refugee crisis. We talked about the bad things that are happening in detention centres. But we've also seen the largest mobilisation since the Second World War of humanitarian workers. Just ordinary, not 
just humanitarian workers, but ordinary citizens who responded to the refugee crisis, not with anti-immigration and nativist sentiments, but actually getting out there to give food, to give money, to give support to children. So it's not all bleak. There is something in Europe, there is a humanitarian ethos there at the bottom of society, and we are seeing that being rejuvenated and energised in equal measure to how we see the crushing of the human spirit under neoliberal policies and under fascism. A very hopeful note to end on. Uh, Liz Fakiti is director of the Institute of Race Relations in London. Liz, thanks so much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.